Presbyterian Theonomy number 10, number 10, and um, our text is going to be Psalm 110, and we're t discussing today uh, theocracy and Christocracy, uh, a central motif of scripture, very important, and we're talking about the rule of Christ. This morning we talked about it in general, a lot of introductory material, today we're going to focus on Christ. <clears throat> the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod out of thy strength, the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. That has to do with thy youth. <clears throat> the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads of many, over many countries. He shall lift up. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. <clears throat> Now, this morning we looked at theocracy, and we've come to the New Testament and Christocracy. We began that, and we're going to continue. We want to clarify some things. People are confused about theocracy. People are confused about Christocracy. And we want to uh, basically answer the questions you may have and any difficulties that you may have due to uh, the typical teaching that's going around. <clears throat> so we need some corrective direction for a number of reasons. First, <clears throat> many people do not understand that the Lord's victory at the cross and the empty tomb is both definitive and progressive. It is definitive in the sense that the complete, perfect, and final victory was already ch achieved and secured when the Savior uttered, it is finished. John 19, 30, and rose the victor over Satan, sin, and death. The war was already won at that point. <clears throat> the work of salvation was fully achieved. The enemies of truth, justice, and holiness were defeated. The regeneration of all things was secured. And there can be no doubt about the final outcome of the battle between Christ's people and the devils. For Satan's head was crushed at the cross. Genesis 3.15. And he is now a chained beast. Revelation 21-3. <clears throat> Isaiah 33.22. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Our Lord's definitive victory is the basis for his kingdom's continued progress in time and on earth <clears throat> unto an actual victory in history. And this reality lies behind the command of the Great Commission. All the nations are to be discipled and brought under the rule of Jesus Christ because he has been given Okay, Matthew 28, 18 and following. It's aorist tense. At a point in time in the past, Christ was given all authority over heaven and earth. In Psalm 110, Christ is seen sitting at the right hand of the Father in order to rule in the midst of his enemies and judge the nations that do not bow before him. And Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm the most quoted Old Testament passage in the whole New Testament, by the way. <clears throat> Paul recognized in 1 Corinthians 15 that the purpose of Jesus' reign is to progressively subdue his enemies and reign until all his enemies are subjected to his authority. <clears throat> all his adversaries are to be reduced progressively until rebellion against his throne comes to an end. And this is describing 
what takes place between the first and second coming of Christ. It is not describing a premillennial reign. All the enemies of the Redeemer and his people are to be subjected to the empire of Christ, as Isaiah prophesied. <clears throat> 60, verse 12. The nation and kingdom which will not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. Nations that refuse to serve Christ and rulers that rebel against, uh, against him are assured of the wrath of the Lamb. Psalm 2, 5 and 9, you shall speak to them in his wrath. He shall speak to them in his wrath. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. The civil magistrate's only way to avoid destruction is to serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 2, 11. Civil governments must kiss the son. They must render him obeisance, homage, and obedience or else suffer the consequences of rebellion, Psalm 2.12. In Psalm 67, we learn that Jesus will judge the people of the earth with justice and govern all the nations, verse 4. All the ends of the earth shall fear him, verse 7. Psalm 72 tells us the Messiah will rule with righteousness and justice, verses 1 to 4. That all the nations from sea to sea will serve him, 7 to 11. Now, that hasn't happened yet, has it? And all nations will call him blessed, verse 17. How the mediatorial king will bring justice to the nations and establish religious, righteous civil governments is revealed in Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, <clears throat> where we are told that the Savior will bring justice to the Gentiles and that even the coastlands, it's a designation in Scripture, for lands extremely far away. Even the coastlands will wait for his law. You see, his redemption that he brings is wonderful because he redeems a nation and he gives them his law. He gives them justice. The Messiah brings justice to the earth through the gospel and the law. And this point is set forth explicitly in the prophecy of Micah, uh, which we must remember is couched in Old Testament terminology. That's the way Old Testament prophecies are given in the New Covenant era. <clears throat> 4, 1 and 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days, that is the New Covenant era, that's what the term means, the latter days. Many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, the church is going to teach the nations Christ's law. Civil magistrates are going to become Christians, and they're going to obey Christ's law, and they're going to put it into legislation. <clears throat> Here's what the great covenanter William Symington writes. And I want you to pay really close attention to this, because... Uh, this view of, against natural law as something to replace biblical law is rejected by the covenanters. It's not some theonomy thing. It's not some Van Til thing. This is something taught by the covenanters before Van Til was born. Quote, It is the duty of nations as subjects of Christ to take his law as their rule. They are apt to think it enough that they take as their standard of legislation and administration human reason, natural conscience, public opinion, or political expediency. None of these things, however, nor indeed all of them together, can supply a sufficient guide in affairs of state. <clears throat> of course, heathen nations who are not in possession of the revealed will of God must be regulated by the law of nature. But this is no good reason why those who have a revelation of the divine will should be restricted to the use of a more imperfect rule. It is absurd to contend that because civil society is founded in nature, men are to be guided in directing its affairs and consulting its interests solely by the light of nature. Might not the same be said of, as, with as much propriety of many other revel, relations of human life, such as parents and children? Husbands and wives, masters and servants, the duties of which we never think of exempting from the control of preternatural revelation? Nay. 
Might it not with equal propriety be maintained, as was formerly hinted, that if certain religious duties, such as prayer and praise, are founded in nature, we are in the performance of them to have no respect either to the authority of directions of the Holy Scriptures? <clears throat> the truth is that revelation is given to man to supply the imperfections of the law of nature and to restrict ourselves to the latter and renounce the former in any case in which it is competent to guide us is at once to condemn God's gift and defeat the end for which it was given. We contend then that the Bible is to be our rule, not only in matters of a purely religious nature, in matters connected with conscience and the worship of God, but in matters of, of a civil or political nature. To say that, such matters, that in such matters we have nothing to do with the Bible is to maintain what is manifestly untenable, to require nations who possess the sacred volume to confine themselves in their political affairs to the dim light of nature is not more absurd than it would be to require men when the sun is in the heavens to shut it out its full blaze and go about their ordinary duties by the feeble rays of a taper. Indeed, if nations are moral subjects, they are bound to regulate their conduct by whatever laws their moral governor has been pleased to give them and as they are the subjects of the mediator. They must be under the law of the mediators contained in the scriptures. He has not placed his moral subjects in ignorance of his will, nor left them to search for it amid the obscurities and imperfections of a law which sin has effaced and well nigh obliterated. In the holy scriptures of truth, he has given them a fair and more complete exhibition of the principles of immutable and eternal justice than that which is to be found in the law of nature. End of quote. Okay, that's 1800s. That the intent, goal, and accomplishment of the Great Commission is in a world uh, of nations. <clears throat> uh, accomplishment of the Great Commission is a world of nations that have, been a, that have adopted a Christocracy is made clear by other prophecies. Okay, when you interpret something in the Bible, you want to look at the whole Bible. Daniel teaches that a king will be established at the ascension of Jesus. <clears throat> Daniel 7.13 tells us explicitly that the messianic kingdom is established when the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, ascends or comes up to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, in the heavenly throne room. This is not a descent, but an ascent. He comes up to the Ancient of Days. He, the premillennialist, has it referring to the descent of Christ. Well, God the Father doesn't live on planet Earth. God the Father lives in heaven in the throne room. So Daniel teaches that a kingdom will be established at the ascension of Jesus that will smash the feet representing the fourth great world empire, Daniel 2, 43-44. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 2.44. Well, in A.D. 3.12, Constantine converted to Christ and became the emperor. And in A.D. 3.80, the Christian faith became the official faith of the Roman Empire. The whole empire. So through spiritual means, through the preaching of the gospel, through church planning, through preaching the whole counsel of God, without lifting one weapon, without one sword, without one shield, without one battle, Christ conquered the Roman Empire. It happened in history. The stone that smites the world Empires existing under the fourth empire, imperial rule. Daniel 2.35 became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This image, which is tied to the first coming of Christ, not the second, reveals continual progress over time or progressive development. While in history there are many setbacks, so the kingdom grows in the midst of great struggle and resistance, the stone will eventually accomplish a complete victory. Daniel 7.27. 
Now, it is our contention, just a side note, it is our contention that only a post-millennial eschatology <coughs> fits into the teaching of Daniel 2, 32-45. The premillennial theory contradicts this chapter in a number of ways. First, the timing's all wrong. Because they tie Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 to the second coming of Christ, not the first coming. <clears throat> this blatant error, which is a blatant error, forces them to come up with absurd and untenable, the absurd and untenable invention of a holy, uh, a revived Roman Empire in the future. They break the organic nature of the meaning of the, the one statue, which emphasizes one empire replacing another chronologically in history with the idea of a 2,000 year gap and a 10 nation confederacy based on the 10 toes of the statue, which by the way are not even mentioned. The toes are never mentioned. Not only are the toes never identified as kings, but the stone falls on the feet of the statue, not on the toes. Oops. Oops. They, they forgot to check that out, didn't they? <clears throat> Remember, it's the toes that are supposed to represent the ten-nation confederacy of the new Roman Empire. In addition... If Daniel 7 refers not to the ascension, but the second coming, then Christ returns to earth to find God the Father living on this planet with his angels. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Second, in the premillennial scheme, the rock falls, the millennium begins, and Jesus sits in Jerusalem, ruling immediately over a full-blown worldwide messianic empire. That's what they teach. I know, I used to be premillennial. This view is exceptionally popular among evangelicals. It's obviously unscriptural. For we are told explicitly that the rock grows progressively throughout history from a stone to a mountain. The overthrow of the Gentile world powers are not sudden and total, but rather slow, almost imperceptible and progressive. Jesus emphasized this fact in his parable of the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13, 30, and especially the parable of the mustard seed, Matthew 13, 31 to 32, and the leaven in the meal. Matthew 13, 33. It leavens the loaf until the whole loaf is leavened. Okay, how does leaven work? Slowly, almost imperceptibly, but it works. It spreads. The millennial view, the amillennial view is much better than premillennialism, but interprets the victor victory, victorious language of the Old Testament prophecies <coughs> regarding the nations inadequately inadequately. The paradigm of amillennialism is the church existing in Babylon. Okay, the Jews existing in Babylon were like that. It is a tiny ghetto in a sea of worldliness and unbelief. In the amillennial view, <clears throat> the foot is not really crushed and replaced in actuality until the second coming and final judgment. All the talk of the nations embracing the Messiah and the prophets and going and studying his law and adopting his law is spiritualized away to mean simply the planting of churches here and there with no social or civil effects. And I know because I was also an amillennialist. For them, the Great Commission and the uh, Christocracies are an ideal that will never be accomplished in time or on earth. An honest millennials to say, yeah, that should be our goal. That's what Christ wants us to do, but it's not going to happen. It's a goal that will be unfulfilled until Christ returns. Amillennialism became popular in the reform circles after World War I because, number one, premillennialism is so clearly unscriptural and can be refuted by a knowledgeable fifth grader. And two, it increasingly looks from a purely human standpoint Okay, not, not the Bible standpoint, but from a purely human standpoint, as if the world will never be Christianized. The world's a basket case. It's getting worse right now. In fact, since the Civil War, Darwinism, and the rise of modernism, the Western nations have become more and more secularized, pagan, and anti-Christian. I can see the popularity of amillennialism, but we are not to take 
our cue from the newspaper or the newscast. We have to simply trust in the word of God and know that God is sovereign, Christ is sovereign, he will accomplish his purposes. Christ may not come back for a thousand years, we don't know. And I always tell people, look at Europe in, four, in 1500 under the papacy in its worst state. And along comes Martin Luther, there's a revival, and half of Europe is converted to Christ in only a couple of decades. So don't think that God can't do it. Base your eschatology on the Bible, not on the New York Times. And here's Isaiah 9, 6 and following. Excuse me here. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish Isaiah's promise from God that the government will rest upon the shoulders of the Messiah. That's Isaiah 6, 9, uh, 9 6 and following. And there shall be no end of the increase of his government, which shall be characterized by justice, righteousness, and peace. All things are being put in subjection under the feet of Christ, Hebrews 2.8. Even world dominions and thrones. There is no area of God's creation where Christ is not Lord. His role is to be authoritative in the church as well as in the state. Christ is seated above every rule, power, and authority. Since he is the head of over all things, all things are subjected under his feet. Ephesians 1, 21 and following, and of course, Matthew 28, 18 and following. This is what the Bible says. Are you going to believe it or not? And then second, the fact that the kingdom is spiritual does not mean that it does not affect things outside of the human heart or the church. Okay, this is a very illogical Thing that people come up with. Well, the kingdom is spiritual, so it has nothing to do with life. <laughs> it's, or it's spiritual, it, it, can, it, can, it can refer to the family, it can refer to the church, but nothing else. A heart that is regenerated, that loves Christ and his word, will seek to apply that word to the home, to the business, to the civil government, and all earthly institutions. Yes, it's a spiritual kingdom. Yes, it's a kingdom of grace. But it has effects that are tangible in this world. The idea that since the kingdom of God is spiritual, the church must not attempt to apply the Bible outside of the prayer closet, the home of the church, is a form of unbiblical pietism. It is a retreat from the dominion mandate. And it surrenders society and culture to the church's enemies. It has paralyzed our Christian responsibility to be a salt and light to culture by preserving what is good and biblical and working to eliminate what is evil and corrupting. It has greatly narrowed the significance of the Christian world and life view for epistemology, ethics, science, economics, the arts, and civil rule. It is a surrender of the original reform viewpoint for an Anabaptist ghetto mentality. If you know your church history, if you look at Calvin, you look at John Knox, you look at the early reformers, they don't think like modern reform people at all. Modern reform people have more in common with Baptists, with Anabaptists, than they do with the original reformers. It's a ghetto mentality that believes that the devil and not Christ is king of this world. It is tragic because it gives Christians and churches an excuse for doing little to nothing to disciple whole nations. It is especially lamentable given the fact that in Europe and America it has caused a great reversal of the spiritual gains made by the hard work of our more faithful and much more biblical spiritual forefathers. Look at the great achievements in Scotland. Look at the great achievements, not nearly as good as Scotland, but look at how good Great Britain used to be. Things used to be a lot better in a lot of places. And look at the degeneration. Homosexual marriage, folks. Christians are going to be persecuted if they don't toe the line on homosexuality. Do 
today in the United States, Calvinistic Bible-believing churches are a tiny minority existing in a wicked, pagan, largely secular nation. Not because of the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, but because of bad theology, apostasy, and irresponsibility. Christians drop the ball, and then they try to blame it on prophecy. Oh, well, God wanted it to be that way anyway. No, you were irresponsible. You handed the robes of society over to a bunch of pagans. You have nobody but to blame but yourself. The church is what's wrong. Believers need to understand that the death and resurrection of Christ is not simply an intellectual truth or a truth only for believers, but a truth that speaks to all reality. Christianity is not just a series of truths. It is the truth. Truth about all of reality. And in holding to that truth intellectually, and then in living upon that truth, the truth of what is brings forth not only certain personal results, but also governmental and legal results as well. Christians have been taught in America by the Enlightenment concept of pluralism that crucial truths can be compartmentalized. Jesus and salvation is for church. Prayer and praise, that's for Sunday. But education, civil government, and businesses are secular matters that are essentially neutral. They are areas to which believers and unbelievers can agree, at least in general. They can get along and they can work together for good, a good law-abiding society. As uh, the professor from Dallas Theological Seminary said on television in 1987 or whenever that show was on the Christian Reconstruction Movement, uh, he said, we don't want a Christian America. We want a moral America. That's Geisler. That's the most irrational, idiotic statement I've ever heard. We don't want a Christian America. We want a, a moral America. You can't have a moral America unless you have a Christian America. But such thinking, all such thinking, is really a compromise of this evil world system. It is at best syncretism, which is sinful and degrading, and at worst is a complete surrender. And you say, oh, come on, you're exaggerating. Well, why do you think, what is it, 95% of evangelicals have their children in public school system that's pro-socialist, pro-sodomite rights, and all sorts of garbage? Because they, they segregate life up. Well, Sunday, that's church. The rest of the week, they can go to the public school and, and get neutral education. No, they, there is no neutrality. All attempts by professing Christians to work or compromise a secular humanist have always failed. They've always failed. In such cases, alleged believers have either simply adopted a pagan world and life view with Christian terminology redefined according to secular humanistic presuppositions. That's, of course, what the modernists have done. Modernist churches today, and there's lots of modernist churches, most of the mainline, all the mainline denominations are modernist. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the resurrection. They believe in socialism. They believe in Karl Marx. They believe in President Obama. They say they believe in the resurrection, but they redefine the resurrection totally out of accord with what the Bible says. Or... They are content with seeking unbiblical and rather meaningless reforms toward theistic truths in general. For example, let's have prayer in the public schools. Oh, well, we can't get prayer. Well, let's have a silent time. Or let's have a prayer, but it's not prayer to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. All this is meaningless. These things are meaningless. If you're not praying to God the Father in Jesus Christ's name, God doesn't want your prayers. Or attempts at placing intelligent design in the public school books, textbooks for public schools. Not six-day creationism by God the Father through the pre-incarnate Christ, but intelligent design. 
which posits, well, there may be some sort of deity that did this, or a panel of deities, or uh, a board of deities that decided to create the world. See, that's not, we're not, we don't argue for theism in general. We don't argue for a God. We argue for the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, the triune God of the Bible. <clears throat> Those who, in essence, have rejected the real lordship of Christ in biblical law are left to beg for a few crumbs from the humanists. Let us have a silent time at our football game, will you? Can we have a silent time? They are like the men of the Light Brigade, 1854, who through fervent zeal were sent in the wrong direction with the same results. The famous Light Brigade was sent into a, a bunch of cannons. <laughs> They had cannons on the right, cannons on the left, and cannons in front of them. They were supposed to circle around and hit them on the side. They got the, bat, the wrong direction. So they head right into the cannons, and the result was a slaughter. Many Christians today have adopted an unbiblical form of pietism that is more in common with Platonic spirituality than Christian doctrine. <clears throat> they make a sharp division between the spiritual and physical realms and consider the material world as intrinsically evil and worthless. Let us save a few souls and wait for the rapture. For the Antichrist, he's coming. He's coming. Or let us only preach salvation sermons and talk a lot about personal holiness but all that other stuff about the cultural mandate and Christ over the nations, that's a waste of time. And I, I, I know that attitude among conservative Presbyterians. The problem is, is the Bible spends a whole bunch of time talking about the kingship of Christ and Christ over the nations and all these things. You know, if you preach the whole counsel of God, you've got to talk about these things. Oh, it's never going to happen. Anyway, at least until Jesus returns, stop wasting your time. That's another attitude. Let us apply the Bible to only a small, isolated slice of life and leave the rest to the devil. That's what I was taught when I was an evangelical, a dispensationalist. Don't polish brash on a sinking sift. Don't waste your time. The problem with this way of thinking <clears throat> is that it is radically unbiblical. The Bible teaches a comprehensive world and life view. It speaks to every conceivable aspect of reality, either directly or by way of implication. The Bible's very comprehensive. You say, well, it doesn't talk about brushing your teeth. Well, it talks about brushing your teeth by way of implication. True spirituality covers all of reality. There are many things the Bible tells us. Absolutes. Things that are sinful, which do not conform to the character of God. But aside from these, the Lordship of Christ covers all of life and all of life equally. Christ is Lord over everything. It is not only that true spirituality covers all of life, but it covers all parts of the spectrum of life equally. Politics, car mechanics, farming, painting, music. In this sense, there is nothing concerning reality that is not spiritual and that is not under the reign of Christ. Think about it. Get this Neoplatonism out of your mind. Moreover, while it is indeed true that Jesus came to redeem his sheep, the elect, or the invisible church, he also came to reestablish the original purpose of the dominion mandate. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And eliminate the effects of the fall upon the whole creation. Romans 8, 18 to 23. Now, while we must focus a great deal of attention on personal evangelism and church planning, just like the apostles did, that should be our focus. There's no question about that. We must also keep the broad goal of transforming all earthly institutions and discipling the nations in our priorities as well, because they are Christ's priorities. This was not made up by Rush Dooney or Greg Bonson or Gary North. These are Christ's priorities. 
The Puritans taught this stuff. The early Presbyterians taught this stuff. The early Reformers taught this stuff. Know your history. Modern Reformed churches are on the wrong side of history, and they're teaching something completely different than what was taught originally. The divine human mediator came to save and sanctify individuals and whole nations. He shed his blood on the cross and he rose from the dead to justify sinners and enable them to know, love, and obey his laws. And then third, Christians today need to consider the broad picture regarding Christ's redemption. For it informs us why God did not simply continue to rule as God, but rather turned authority and rule over to the theanthropic mediator. That is the divine human mediator. Christ, of course, is God, always was king, always was ruling everything. But it's as the Christ, the divine human mediator, he's got a human nature. It is as the Christ that he receives all authority. A soteriological king leading to a worldwide Christocracy was needed because of the fall of Adam. Before he sinned, Adam was commanded to populate the earth and exercise dominion. Genesis 1, 28. If man had not fallen, now I understand that the fall was always in God's plan, but if man had not fallen, there would have been a worldwide civilization living in direct fellowship and communication with Jehovah. That was the command of the dominion mandate. The whole human race would have constituted a kingdom under the, the direct loving rule of God. Under God's direct rule and continuous revelation, mankind would have progressively mastered the environment to God's glory. All of man's endeavors, science, art, inter architecture, agriculture, technology, would have been developed with a love toward God and a love toward man. That is the goal of the dominion mandate. The fall of man and Adam, however, rendered the idea of a God-glorifying culture, kingdom, or civilization impossible. The fall. Adam sinned. And in Adam, we all sin. He was the federal head of the human race. <clears throat> it's impossible apart from salvation provided for a people by God himself. Because of the fall, the human race is guilty before God and polluted by sin. That's why you can say, well, I'm, I, right now I'm going to determine I'll not sin for a whole week. I'm not going to sin once. And then by the end of the day, you're confessing your sins. Because your mind. You're fallen. All men are dead spiritually, Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. Hate the truth. Turn to idols, Romans 1, 18 and following. Dwell in darkness, John 1, 4 and 5. Have a heart of stone, Ezekiel 1, uh, 11, 19. Or helpless, Ezekiel 16, 4 to 6. Cannot repent. Jeremiah 13, 23, cannot see or comprehend divine truth. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, are the slaves of Satan. Acts 26, 17 to 18. The background of the whole picture that the Old Testament paints is that of a world in revolt against God, turned aside from God, sunk, and ever sinking deeper in unrighteousness, abandoned to idolatry, and to the lusts and corruptions which are the Natural fruit of apostasy from the Creator. A world in contrariety to the divine holiness and judged as guilty and justly exposed to divine anger and judgment. So, obviously, such a world's not going to have a godly civilization, is it? The soteriological kingship of Christ can only be truly understood against the background of the pre-fall dominion mandate and the spiritual death rebelling against God and slavery to sin and subservience to Satan that resulted from the fall. That's why we have to have a Christocracy. That's the only way we can have godly rule in this world. Because of the fall, Satan is called the god of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And Jesus repeatedly referred to the devil as the ruler of this world. John 12, 31, 14, 30, and 16, 11. Our Lord says to the unbelieving Jews, you are of your father, the devil. John 8, 44. He was their covenantal father because they were not true believers. And the apostle John says that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5, 19. Satan is called the ruler of the demons, 
Mark 3, 22, and the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, 2. Satan is said to have a throne, Revelation 2, 13, and he exercises such power over the unbelieving world that he mistakenly thinks that he can offer authority over all kingdoms of the world to Christ. Remember the temptation narrative. And the devil taking him up on a high mountain, this is Luke 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Of course, Satan said, get behind me, Satan. The way to get the kingdoms of the world was through the cross, and Jesus knew it. The kingdoms of the world have been given to Satan, not by God, but by the kings and citizens of these kingdoms who gave their power and honor to the devil. As Paul says, they have been taken captive by, his, by him to do his will, 2 Timothy 2.26. The coming of Christ and his redemptive restorative kingdom restores the dominion mandate to its original God-glorifying purpose. counteracts the effects of the fall upon the elect of all nations, binds the devil so that he can no longer control the nations as he once did, Revelation 20, uh, 1 to 3, Hebrews 2, 14, and Acts 10, 38. He defeated the devil. Subdues the enemies of God and the covenant people and ultimately restores the whole created order. The whole creation groans. There's going to be a day when the earth is actually superior to what it was before the fall. Okay, Christ didn't come to get rid of the world so we could all live on clouds. Christ came to redeem the world, to regenerate all things. Given the purpose and goal of the kingdom, the redemptive king is called the second Adam. Romans 5, 12 to 21. The firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And the beginning of the creation of God, Romans, excuse me, Revelation 15. Christ's restorative, recreative role is set forth by Paul when he parallels the first and create, second in creations. This is extremely interesting. Colossians 1, 15 to 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him, thing, in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, all thing, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He's the original creator, and he's the recreator. The, th the whole universe was thrown into chaos because of the fall. And I should have quoted the passage from Jeremiah that talks about this. It's very clear. Christ comes to restore order. All the effects of the fall will be completely eliminated by Christ. Here's what Calvin says. He is the beginning because he is the firstborn from the dead. For in the resurrection there is a restoration of all things. And in this manner, the commencement of a second and new creation. For the former had fallen to pieces in the ruin of the first man. End of quote. So Jesus is king because he is the savior. He establishes the kingdom of grace and he rides forth on the white horse to conquer the world by its word and spirit. He came to establish the rule of God in this world. And this is accomplished through the gospel and the establishment of his law word as a foundation for truth, meaning, and ethics. Okay, let's not reduce what the Bible teaches about the role of Christ. The law is now called the law of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9.21. Not simply because the, old, the law under the old administration of the covenant of grace has been replaced, but because all men and nations are accountable to Christ. The Mosaic law is replaced with the law of Christ. It's the same law. The ethics are all the same. 
But now everybody's accountable to the divine human mediator. Everybody's accountable to the theanthropic Christ. Everybody's accountable to Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus Christ that's going to sit on the white lustrous throne at the end of human history and judge every man, woman, and child who ever lived. And how will he do it? By his law. By his law. And then fourth, and we'll just, I, I guess we better just start this and continue. <clears throat> fourth, the expression of the kingdom of God must not always be restricted to the church. People want to keep it really narrow. It has only to do with the church. It has only to do with spiritual things. Those who do not see any sort of dominion mandate in scripture or review the Great Commission as a call to save a few individuals here and there cling to a very narrow concept of Christ's kingdom. Here's a quote from uh, <clears throat> Ronald Hanko, Protestant Reformed Church. Any attempt to make the kingdom something broader than or other than the church is wrong. End of quote. That's the Protestant, Theolog Protestant Reform Theological Journal. <clears throat> and this, is a, this view of limiting the kingdom to the church is especially true of negative amillennialists who see the church as destined to remain a tiny remnant in a sea of unbelief until the second coming. This highly pessimistic and unbiblical eschatology results not only in an expectation of failure for the Great Commission. Let's be honest, it does. The Great Commission will fail. But also the idea that it is wrong to even attempt to Christianize all cultures. It's one thing to say, well, it's not going to happen. I'm an, I'm, I'm, I'm an amillennialist. All those great passages in the Old Testament about victory... They just mean that there's going to be some churches here and there. That's all it really means. We can spiritualize it all away. Uh, that'd be bad enough. But to turn around and say we shouldn't even try to attempt to Christianize society and culture. Note the pessimistic amillennialism of Herman Hoxima. And, you know, I've got a bunch of his books. I like his stuff. But on this, he's wrong. Quote, <clears throat> They share by faith in the victory which Christ has gained for them. And in the consciousness of that victory, they fight the good fight of faith, not indeed in the hope that they can have, make a kingdom of God out of the present world, but living the kingdom life in every sphere of life and representing the cause of the Son of God in the midst of a world that lies in darkness. Therefore, they put on the whole armor of God, considering it grace that in the cause of Christ, they may not only believe in him, but also suffer with him. For they know that as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, they are still in Babylon. And in Babylon in this world, listen to this, this is, this is what I find objectionable, they do not expect an outward victory. They know that in the world they shall have tribulation, for as long as the world hated their king, so they will be hated. Uh, it will hate them if they are faithful. And that is... Uh, from his exposition, uh, expository sermons on the Lord's Prayer. When Hoxima discusses the error of people making a kingdom of God out of the world, presumably by their own humanistic efforts, we heartily agree. Okay, if he's talking about modernism. Modernism adopted the concept of post-millennialism and uh, the dominion of Christ and basically infused it with secular humanism and Marxism. Yeah, we agree with him there. Such thinking is the backbone of modernism in all its forms. We also heartily agree that believers must live in the kingdom of life in every sphere of life. We do not understand, however, given the promises of God of the great victory of the gospel throughout the world, why Hoxima has such a tremendous pessimism. Once again, both premillennialists and amillennialists view the Great Commission as a colossal fail, failure. In fairness to our amillennial brothers, we should point out that the Protestant Reformed Church represents the most pessimistic form of amillennialism on the reform scene today. And I want you to note that not all amillennialists restrict the concept of the kingdom of God to the church. Here's what Louis Burkhoff says in his Systematic Theology. And next week, 
Lord willing, I'll, I'll talk about this and define this more clearly. We don't have time today. Here's what Burkhoff says. It is closely related to the church, though not altogether identical with it. The citizenship of the kingdom is coextensive with the membership in the invisible church. Its field of operation, however, is wider than that of the church, since it aims at the control of life in all its manifestations. That's Burkhoff. Now, there's much of the, in the statement of Hoxma that we can agree with. Given the overall prophetic picture of the church and the, and the Gentile nations in the New Covenant era, there is no biblical reason to maintain the persecuted church in Babylon for all of history viewpoint, however. That's what I object to. Oftentimes the church finds itself in the situation of the, of the Jews in Babylon. But to assume that's the way it's always going to be, or that's the norm, and that we shouldn't try to change it, that's simply wrong. The Protestant Reformed Church may not expect outward victory, but David, the prophets, Christ, and Paul did expect it. And so should we. Those who want to restrict the New Testament concept of the kingdom of God to only the church or only spiritual matters of the heart have failed to note that the expression is used in a number of different ways in Scripture. So we're going to stop here and look at this next week. And we'll wrap this up and deal with some more objections, Lord willing. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is used in many different ways in the New Testament. And you have to look at the context to see how it's being used. The kingdom of God does refer to the visible church. The kingdom of God also refers to salvation. The kingdom of God is also used of the consummate kingdom when Christ returns. The kingdom of God is also used as of the privileges of the kingdom of God. There are several different ways the kingdom of God is used. And the kingdom of God is used in a broad sense to refer to planet Earth. So we have to be careful and not reduce the meaning of Christ's victory and not reduce our responsibility for the dominion mandate. Now, I am not advocating political action as a solution to anything. What I'm advocating is is that the goal of evangelism, the goal of church planning, the goal of people becoming Christians is to apply that to society, to apply that to their sphere of life, to apply that to their business, to apply that to what they do. And eventually, the whole lump will be leavened. And you will have a Christian president. You will have a Christian Congress. Can you imagine that? You will have a Christian military. But right now, we don't. And we don't because Christians accepted pluralism. They made a pact with the devil. They rejected covenanting with Christ. They rejected a national constitution dedicated to Christ. They accepted the enlightenment concept, uh, concept of pluralism. And now they're going to have to pay the piper because they're going to be persecuted because secular humanists don't like Christianity. And there is no neutrality. They're not going to put up with Christians. They're not. They know who the enemy is. Do you think if, Ob if Obama had the power and authority, I think he would lock up Christians tomorrow if he could. The ones that are not liberal and Marxist, of course. We'll continue this next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for such a comprehensive salvation. We thank you that Christ is Lord. We thank you that he's the king, that he's the Lord over Lord and king over kings. Lord, help us to be obedient to the king, to apply your law word to our hearts and to submit to it in our private lives, in our families, in our businesses, and in the state. Help us, Lord, to work for the dominion mandate, which is now salvific because of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.